Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'll give everybody a couple more minutes just to, to come. Um, any questions that from last week that came up or that we, that we can start with? Gwen, would you be willing to talk a little bit more about that gum that I brought up? Oh, yeah. And, yeah, definitely. And actually, yeah. and I can show the gum. I found right. this gum. Yeah. And on it, it says no aspartame. Tame? Aspartame? Aspartame, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things that when we talked last week, you were saying that um, some of the fake sugars make your body think that you're eating sugar and then you have the insulin response and then you still have that problem even though it's not really sugar and i was just wondering if that if the chemical in this gum does that right 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 actually that's important that you distinguish that because i kind of responded to it, to it from a teeth perspective of the xylitol that's in that that gum is actually good for your teeth so it helps to balance your uh, the flora in your mouth. Um, so it's, and it also strengthens the enamel. However, from an artificial sweetener perspective, even the sugar alcohols, they're a little bit less impactful, but they're still, they still do cause some of that insulin response, just not as much. Um, so any sugar alcohols, um, the aspartame is actually sweeter. So it creates more of that response, but the, uh, but the sugar alcohols, you know, still will do it to a certain extent. Um, yeah, but that, that gum is actually really good for your teeth. Uh, xylitol is, is excellent for strengthening your teeth. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, last um, in the last few days, we were supposed to write down our breakfasts mm -hmm. and all that. And so um, I had an experience that just proved this about the artificial sweeteners. Yeah. Mine, okay. mine of choice is stevia. I have mm -hmm. no problems with it. Some people find it bitter. It doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been adding, um, trying to add flaxseed ground back into my diet because mm -hmm. I think it's another reason why my cholesterol shot up. I wasn't yeah. making smoothies with that anymore. And right. Anyway. It's so easy for it to fall off the list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and, and um, so I found these uh, Shobani yogurts because mm -hmm. normally um, I avoid milk too, but the mm -hmm. yogurt seems to be okay. And mm -hmm. it's, it's no sugar yogurt. They use stevia. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I take a half of a little tub mm -hmm. and I was putting in the two tablespoons of um, flaxseed. Mm -hmm. And then I would chop up a few pieces of one of those stevia chocolate bars mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and put that in after lunch. And um, on the other day, uh, a few hours later, I got so hangry. <laughs> it was just like total hormonal, you know, all right. of my period, you know, one of those. And I don't get periods anymore. Right, so right. It was like, but, what is this? What is this? Right. So, That's um, really dramatic shift. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, stevia can do it just mm -hmm. like sugar. Yep. Uh, yep. That's a really, so you really like did the experiment and got really, you know, important results actually is knowing. That well, that, you know, the experiment yeah. also at breakfast, we had blueberry bushes. Mm -hmm. So I freeze them and, yeah. and once every couple of weeks or so, we'll have blueberry pancakes. The only way we have pancakes. But mm -hmm. um, I always make sure I add protein to it. Mm -hmm. So there's there's egg in there. Mm -hmm. um, I use again the ground flax and some bran or whatever and and try to make it have some protein in it mm -hmm. and um, I don't get that reaction from pancakes mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah totally yeah. because they're kind of the they're, they're different than like the kind of classic pro pancakes that don't you know their, right. their ratios sound quite different in terms of protein so that's good to know that like actually the higher protein pancakes you did just fine with them and that that's kind of nice for people especially people who really love their pancakes and their blueberry pan fresh blueberry pancakes sound lovely um and so you know really that you don't have to give up your pancakes if you just add a little bit more protein um even some people when they're making their pancakes they take they do they add an extra egg and then they also add um a little a bit of protein powder actually to the mix um, so an unflavored protein powder um, that can go horribly wrong and you make them really gross. Um, but if you get just the right amount, Bob's Red Mill actually makes a decent um, protein pancake uh, um, uh, 
like mix basically that that is pretty Ooh. high in protein and it's decent. What um, did you say? Uh, Bob's Red Mill. Oh, um, okay. yep. And uh, it was just that it, Ocean State Job Lab has the best sort of like selection of Bob's Red Mill options, um, and they do definitely have it there. Um, so, but it sounds like you found ways to do that without having to get the special mix. You just add the extra extra egg and everything. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else have some findings that came up with their uh, with their breakfast experiments? Mm -hmm. Regarding the pancakes, I did, I've been making my own mix because my kids really like waffles and pancakes, but I'm just like, oh, this is not what I want for them. You know what I mean? I want them to be eating more protein in the morning to sort of sustain them. And so I tried that. There's that other name brand of, of mixes and, and they have muffin mixes and Kodiak. granola bars and all this stuff. Kodiak. Kodiak. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this past weekend we used that, we made pancakes one day, we made waffles the next day. They made really good waffles and the pancakes were good too, but they were a little bit denser than mm -hmm. a regular pancake, but tasty. Nobody complained. And I have a lot of kids and they complain yeah. about you know, yeah. everything. Everybody. So if they would be like, um, this isn't the normal kind, you know, so <laughs> it was good. You know, I had like a lot of smiles. So I took that as well. Excellent. Oh, good, good, good. Did you notice any difference? Like after the pancakes, the, the after effects being different in the, in the family? Honestly, there's just too many of them. Oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> there's a lot of them. And it, it, my my girls are, are 9, 10, 10, 11, and 13. Mm -hmm. And then the boys are 18 and 19. So what that means is there's a lot of hormone shifting right now. Mm, it's kind of a shit show. Totally right. right. <laughs> you know what the pancakes are doing or not doing in that scenario. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Well, I can't tell. <laughs> Yep, totally. You know, that we call that multifactorial in uh, in in research. <laughs> I have one other tip about pancakes, though. Would the kids would the kids hate it if you put some nuts in them, some walnuts, just mm -hmm. and and you know chopped. I, I don't know. I don't know. Cause with the Kodiak ones, if you use real milk and an egg, it says it's like 20 grams of protein or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that breaks down amidst all the pancakes, but they were willing to tolerate it. And so I felt like it was a win. I, if I put the walnuts in, I, I might push them over the edge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, uh, even though, you know, a lot of people put butter on their pancakes, putting nut butter on your pancakes actually does, you know, will, will decrease the uh, the glycemic load and also give a little bit more protein. But but those those Kodiak ones, they really are super high in protein. It's a whey protein. So for anybody who can't tolerate milk very well, it doesn't doesn't do so well for the milk intolerant folks. Um, okay. But it is, um, it's a good source of protein and, and whey protein for people who are <laughs> it's really good for your digestive tract it's really healing and nourishing to to the cells that line the digestive tract um so so that's excellent it really is a good a good step up for anybody who can tolerate that whey protein yeah i i don't know if this is it is what it is but mm -hmm. i oftentimes will make homemade whipped cream and so we use that instead of the maple syrup and then we yeah. use like strawberries and blueberries i'm trying I'm trying. Mm -hmm. Totally. You know? Homemade whipped cream is great. You know, it's really like it's good fresh milk. It doesn't have the chemicals that the that the spray kind has. And it, it's um and it also again because of remember we talked about like those healthy fats and and sort of well, I mean dairy, it depends on who you ask. Some people, you know, put it in different categories in terms of saturated fats, but um the uh, uh but but you know, especially for young people, you know, really if it's especially if it's well sourced, you know, so like an organic or a grass fed. Milk, even better, but um, uh, but it has that um that will lower the glycemic index of the food because of those, the fats and the things or slow the, the digestion of this the carbohydrates so that it um, makes it not not quite as reactive. So so that's great, absolutely. Anybody else have any any findings or or discover any new breakfast foods that works for them or um? Can I ask else? you? Can I use a question? Yeah. Um, I'm having maybe questionable gallbladder issues. Mm. And I eat a lot of eggs and I was reading that eggs are not good for gallbladder. I was yeah. shocked. It's true. Uh, eggs are one of the trigger foods. So basically anything with fat, with significant amounts of fats in it can be a trigger for gallbladder issues. Usually people can get away with like one egg a day, but if they're getting up into the three and four, you know, if they're eating eggs for breakfast and lunch or 
um, that's when they, they can start to have trouble. Um, or especially if they're making it into like an egg salad and, and adding mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is another big trigger for gallbladder issues because of the uh, the fat content. Um, so, um, is it the yolk or is it the whites? The yolk, because um, it's really about the fat. Yeah. So if I was, to, I could eat whites. I just can't eat. You, yeah, you probably could tolerate uh, whites just fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Any uh, sort of findings or discoveries or? All right, so let's go ahead and, and launch into this week. Um, we are going to talk about a few more foods, but also just sort of a general, how can we work some of these foods into our diet a little bit more? How do we get more fresh fruits and vegetables um, worked in, you know, some secret, uh, some sort of tricks that, that, that I found over the years and that people have found over the years that make it a little bit easier. Um, and I think kind of for the intro part today, I just really want to talk about how all vegetables are 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 medicinal in their own way. Like the, the real thing is, is that, you know, I could come up with any, you know, I, for, I've done this talk in different ways and, and each time I've had different, different vegetables that I use, you know, usually I, I find some seasonal vegetables that, uh, and so literally you could, you could pick out any three vegetables in the, in the grocery store and I could do this talk about, about them um, and really pull out which, which compounds are, are medicinal, which compounds are antioxidant. Um, which in the accident means anti-cancer. Um, so really vegetables are just wonderful. If you, if a majority of your diet is vegetables, um, that's an excellent way to pre prevent disease and, and nourish your body um, in terms of the, the nutrient levels, as well as the, all of those other compounds that are so good for you in other ways as well. Um, so one thing that, that I really want to talk about whenever I talk about, you know, choosing vegetables and, and making healthy choices is that there's a lot of, um, advertising that sort of makes it the norm or an unquestioned concept that that we're in in a fight with our bodies about about what we want to eat so so the idea that you like you know treat yourself to something that's you know really decadent or sugary or you know sweet or anything like that um versus like oh if you're being good you're going to be you know eating vegetables and the real problem that i really see with that is that it sets up this um we each have, can have an internal parent-child dialogue, which which sounds like uh, you should eat the vegetables. I don't want to eat the vegetables. <laughs> you know, you should eat the vegetables. And and what I really see when I see people actually like transitioning to a really sustainable, you know, healthful, nutritive diet, um, what I see is that they end up kind of finding this third voice, which I think of as being the wise voice, the one that says, you know what, if I eat this. I'm not going to feel that well this afternoon. And I'm also not going to support my long-term health goals. Um, and so it's this, it's the sort of, you know, just we can think about the wise voice that can kind of see the big picture and really is, is making, you know, really uh, decisions about what to do now based on, based on how those decisions will play out and what the, the effects of those decisions will be. Um, so when we get stuck in this parent child thing, the, at some point, you know, the, the, that, that, you know, sort of, I, I don't want to eat the vegetables. I just want to eat the, the chocolate or the everything um, kind of busts through and, 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 and you end up you, at some point if there's enough stress or it's been enough, you know, fatiguing of this sort of um, persistent conversation, the, a person will, will eat the junk food. And it's kind of like, you know, just basically like anything that is kind of considered forbidden or that kind of, um, you know, even there's so many just terms that get thrown around when we talk about, about rich foods, you know, as being like forbidden chocolate or, uh, or decadent, you know, even the word decadent kind of said, means like, oh, it's not good, you know, like you're not supposed to do it. Um, and so I just really want to sort of like take off that that tension or sort of encourage you to, to check that, that internal monologue about whether or not there's, there's a, there's a tension there between one part of you that wants to and the other part that doesn't. Um, and, and whether you're using a lot of the should kind of language or that, um, you know, that the, this is good, this is bad kind of language versus being saying, okay, you know, really looking at, a, at any kind of food options and thinking about how you're going to feel later in the day or tomorrow or um, whether or not that really serves you in a, in a big long term sense. And I guess really to sum that all up, really saying, you know, to really get on the same team as your body, you know, so that um, to really kind of notice that there's a lot of narrative out there about as if like your body is something that you have to control or you have to be, you know, sort of 
managing versus like actually when you really listen to your body a lot of times it's actually you know that that sort of it'll give you feedback about eating really uh nutritious foods as as oh i feel great after i just had that uh you know that that eggs and veggies for breakfast or um or that wonderful salad for lunch um and you'll just get that that kind of feedback and that's a way that that really, you know, actually you and your body can be on the same team. And yes, there are cravings. Yes, there are sort of these, these motivations to eat foods that don't really serve us. And at the same time, um, I find that the less we engage in that kind of attention around it, and the more we sort of call on this, this wise voice, this sort of big picture uh, voice, um, the, the better we, we do in the long term. Um, and, uh, and you'll notice that like, just to kind of over the next week, just sort of watching that internal monologue when it comes to food choices or when you're eating something that you enjoy versus something that you should be eating, you know, and just sort of like watching that and just and, and really, you know, working to find that that place of, of we're on the same team and, and wanting the same thing and, and really that like, oh, I bet that cake would taste really good, but but I also know that I don't really it's not worth it. Um, so that's what often when there's that switch in the in the kind of language that you're using internally, that you find yourself saying it's not worth it a little bit more because you know you can acknowledge, oh, that would taste good, but like is that is that worth sort of ruining my day with that food that I won't feel so so well after eating. Um, so um, so kind of watching for that. And even some people like journal with that really, you know, before eating. They say, you know, like let let's let me get on the same page with my with either for some people it's their future self also so like really you know um kind of contacting and communicating with um a future version of themselves that might be three months from now and it might be you know 10 years from now but um that that future self saying like you know hey can help me help me kind of make good decisions here what what would be in the best interest um, of 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 you, you know, like really, and, and even actually thinking about that future self as someone that you're taking care of, you know, that you're, that you're extending kindness towards every time that you do anything wonderful, whether it's moisturizing your skin or whether it's, um, you know, eating, eating a lovely soup or salad today. Um, so yeah, any questions or thoughts about that? No. I don't have any questions about that, but there's a lot of feedback noise. If everybody could put themselves on mute, except when they're talking, it would be helpful because I was hearing lots of scrunchy stuff. Oh, um, thanks. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Everybody know how to mute themselves, or actually, I can do the muting. If um, so, I'm going to go ahead and make sure everybody's muted here. Yeah, great. Thank you, Kathy. You're right that that's uh that's helpful to not have that those sounds so easy to have them happen. Um. So, um, so I think, you know, this, this part is the kind of moving, moving from that. I just, um, there's a couple of questions and we can either, people can either sit and think about it or they can write about it or, or we can share about it. Um, the, uh, and, or I should say, um, the, uh, the two questions are, um, what would it look like if you treated a friend, like you treat your body, um, or, you know, in terms of that communication and also that, that sort of treatment, what would that, what would that look like in that friendship? Um, if you kind of think about that that relationship, and I'll give you a couple minutes to think about that or write about it. We'll do about 30 more seconds on that.
Uh, right, and it's okay if you haven't quite finished because the next there's another question that we can think about or write about. Um, how can you be more of a friend to your body? Um, sometimes people might think of a time that they felt really like they were they were being kind and friendly to their body. Other times people think about things that they know would would sort of deepen that relationship or or or, or be a, a kind way to interact with their body or talk to themselves or. Um, whatever that might look like for you. Another 30 seconds for that one. So it's absolutely fine to just kind of keep that to yourself and uh, and you know have that writing for yourself, something to, to think about. It might even turn into something that you write and put up on your mirror in the bathroom um, to remind yourself of something you can do that's kind. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to share that, that they wrote about or thought about during that time? Talk. Go ahead. Okay. Um, for me, I would say right now, probably my biggest problem is sleep. Um, you know, I'm trying to, I, I've set aside some parameters of things I want to do. I want to work out every day. I want to drink a lot of water. I want to not drink alcohol and eat healthy foods and avoid sugar and you know, sugary junk and chips and all that. I was sort of getting into a habit of just sort of eating stuff that the kids had and it wasn't good. But what I'm finding is to complete all these tasks I want to do during the day, which are all good for me, it's keeping me up even later. And then because I'm trying to drink all this water, then I'm up drinking later and then I'm not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. And so I really need to get it together in the mornings to like do some of this stuff so I'm not up late. And so it's like one thing is better and then another thing is not good. So yeah, yeah. One do do you want feedback on that or or sort of uh, Sure. Um, all right. Uh so one thing I really notice is that one thing at a time, so really kind of taking one thing for the week that's sort of the focus. Um so a lot of times when people try to take on multiple things at the same time, it's nothing is automatic pilot because if you're adding one new thing that's that's sort of the new thing to think about and work on. Um, the rest gets to be sort of habitual, you know, and then, and you don't have to do a lot of thinking and time into that. Um, and so, and it can be one new thing for the week, one new thing for the month. Um, so really, you know, say this week, focusing on water intake. Um, I think you're that the sleep, sleep is such an interesting one because it, it often is the one that gets kind of cut back on when people are doing, doing more things. Um, and also it's such a central one for helping it's really a foundational one for helping you make those changes. So, you know, both in the sense of, of feeling the well-being to, to, to make a choice about exercise, like uh, that a lot of times if you're not well rested, that's harder to, to really get yourself to do. The other thing is there's been a lot of studies about sleep deprivation and how that affects not only your blood sugar, but also your food choices. So they had this one study where they didn't tell people that this is what they were studying, but they subjected them to um, 
uh, food for sleep deprivation. And what they were actually studying was what, what foods they ate in the room. And so the, the people who were sleep deprived ate an average of 500 more calories and, and chose the more uh, sort of sugary foods and the higher fat foods, the, the, the fried foods and everything like that. Um, and then they flipped the groups and the same thing happened the other direction. So, uh, so really, and then, and then they also measured the, the levels of these two hormones, one's called leptin and the other one's called ghrelin. Leptin is the one that makes you say, oh, I'm fully satisfied with the salad. And ghrelin is the one that like, really is like a gremlin on your shoulder saying, give me the most calorie dense foods you could possibly find now. Um, and, uh, and then just eat them endlessly, like never feel satiated by them. Uh, that's ghrelin. And so when we don't sleep enough, Ghrelin goes up and leptin goes down, and we want we want the opposite. So, so sleep ends up being really a central piece. And I think you know of the whole list, I would actually put you know that one it gets that top place because of the way that it'll just sort of make everything else easier. So it's sort of like the the first domino that makes everything else a lot easier. But like you're saying though, that that difficulty around drinking a lot of water and then being up at night is a, is a tricky one. Um, and I will say that if you increase it more incrementally, so then you don't have as much frequent urination, your body actually kind of gets used to that much water intake and, and you don't have to urinate quite as frequently. Um, if you increase it pretty dramatically, yes, you'll be absolutely waking up a bunch of times to urinate. Um, the other thing that, that is a good one is to, to stop drinking water around two hours before bedtime um, to, try to, to try to get ahead of that. Easier said than done if you're trying to meet a certain goal in terms of water intake. Um, but you know, that kind of like trying to really front load it in the morning. Um, one of the things actually, there's so many different tricks about drinking water. One of the ones that I actually found to be the most helpful was this uh, little, it was a little strap and it had a little blinking light on it. Um, I forget what it's called, but I'm sure, but it, I think um, I can put it, I, I'll send it out the, uh, um, and basically all it did was it flashed a little light when I hadn't, hadn't drank any water in 15 minutes. And it was like amazing. It didn't even beep or anything. So it was actually very helpful, but it would just keep, keep me, you know, cause I tend to be one, you know, people either sip water throughout the day or they're like, you know, the one drink a whole glass of water and then drink another whole glass of water. And I, I tend to be more of the drink a whole glass of water partially because in, in the middle, in the midst of a, of a visit, it's sort of awkward for me to be like drinking, sipping my water the whole time. So, uh, so I'm usually like, glunk, 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 you know, and, and, uh, but that little, that little reminder helped me to not go too long without, without drinking the water. And that way I would meet my water goals by, by that, like, you know, 4 PM sort of time. Um, so that there's less of that urinating at night, but that is a real, a real trick right there. It's always, it's always a hard one, but I would say that gradual incremental increase is probably the best, best bet for helping with that. Yeah. Um, a comment, on, a comment on the water thing. Mm -hmm. um, I found that because it's funny that you said about the wrist thing with the light. I actually set a timer for 15 minutes. It's very annoying, very annoying to you know every 15 minutes, but I noticed if I take just two or three sips every 15 minutes, I don't void as much. It's almost like my body gets a chance to absorb it and utilize it rather than expelling it. Mm -hmm. So that's another trick that, you know, you may want to try. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're right about that, actually. Um, drinking a lot of water at once makes you release more of this uh, or, or makes you make less of that antidiuretic hormone so that you actually do urinate a lot more because your body doesn't really like rapid change. Um, and right. I, and I, I don't think I said it quite right. The, the, the thing actually goes around the water bottle so it can sense when the water bottle is being picked up and put down. Um, and so it actually is like over there on the water bottle flashing at you. Um, not, and, and that way it, it kind of you don't even have to press the reset button on it. It just automatically resets itself. Um, so it knows, it must know, it must sense when it gets picked up and tipped. Yep, must yep. Have kind of sensor in there. That's pretty cool. I'm going to check that out because the timer is kind of annoying. <laughs> I can see how that could be really annoying with the beeping. Every, yeah, yep. Every 15 minutes, so I'm like halfway through the day, I want to just smash it. But it's like, no, you're, you're helping me. You're helping me not to void three times during the night, but. Right, right, but really, that's a lot of beeping. Yep, <laughs> and we all, the, all the other beeps that happen in terms of like, you know, the phone ringing and then this happening and all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get, then you get a nervous tick, and then you got to fix the nervous tick. <laughs> right, right, right. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I, had, I had one. I had one uh, note about the water business. Is I, 
I was on a running team when I was working and our coach got us all in the habit of having water. We were all had desk jobs at our desk and sipping water all day long. And, um, you know, it really showed a difference when we got out on that track. Mm -hmm. um, but also I did marathon training and even marathon training, I, we had to be careful not to just drink water because you talked about it last time about the sodium drop hyponitremia. I forget how, is that how you say it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise known as water on the brain. You, you can die from too much water. So mm -hmm. I'd be very careful about that and consider why you're drinking all that water and that there's such a thing as too much water. We of course would have drink Gatorade because mm -hmm. that gives you the salts back. And, um, and if you're being very concerned about calories, well, that might be a case for going for the low calorie Gatorade. Mm -hmm. But um, we couldn't, even when I was marathon training, a gallon of water would have, I, I don't know, I think it would have killed me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, like that can be, it definitely can be a lot, way too much for people, especially if you don't have an incremental kind of increase. And also, like you were saying, without the, the added electrolytes, definitely can be can be problematic for sure. Um, and, uh, and also potassium is another important one to, to, to right. get into the mix there that, um, you know, even adding a little bit of fruit juice to the water gives you a little bit of potassium as well. Um, and actually the, the, the low calorie Gatorade, you know, is good in terms of watching calories, but also the, the glucose that's in the Gatorade that's in all of the, uh, electrolyte beverages actually helps the water to come into the cells as well. So, um, so it's a, it, it's tricky because I obviously don't want to be drinking want to be eating sugars, but particularly when people are doing um, uh, high intensity exercise, that, that glucose becomes really important for helping the water come out of the bloodstream and into the cells as well. Um, so in moderation, um, and 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 I would say really the kind of the the types with glucose is, is more more if you've been sweating a lot or or doing intensive exercise. Um, if you're not doing the intensive exercise and not sweating a lot, you can do it without the glucose. Um, yeah. I had one other comment about mm -hmm. what it would look like if you treated a friend like you treat your body. Mm -hmm. um, my first thought was, well. If it was my friend, I would want to spoil her. <laughs> yep. You know, I, I want to give her good stuff, man. Rich, you know, um, chocolate mousse and wine and <laughs> all that. Then I kept thinking about it and said, well, really, there's a mind shift here. Yeah. You know, where now I I want to give her really things that are going to be very good for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Salads, et cetera. Yeah, you know, salmon, that kind of thing. You cook a really good salmon dinner, that kind yeah. of thing. So, yeah. so yeah, the mind shift is uh, underway. <laughs> totally, and even kind of playing with that whole like, what is what is this you know sort of difference between like you know like those those treats, the like the, the delicious experiencing you know the actual experiential eating that's like the the things that taste delicious and that are rich and everything else, and and the you know the long term health sort of foods is that is that actually you know really I think a healthy diet does contain a little bit of both you know and, and really in moderation you know of course like you know that's that it's all about actual like you know portions and 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 you know looking at, at what we're how often we're having those things and portion control and everything but but really that that when when the eating is a sensory experience so like making the salmon but putting some some herbs on top of it so it has like a more of a flavor and more of a smell and and those kinds of things like actually putting a little bit more effort into that sensory experience like you would if you had a friend coming over for dinner is really a an excellent um an excellent way to make that you know that that food you know enjoyable in all of the ways you know like enjoyable during and after eating it um, you know, and, and sometimes I think about actually, and it's interesting that kind of taking it in that direction. When when I was writing that question, I was actually thinking about how the ways we, you know, talk to ourselves about about eating things or about doing things. Sometimes it has a, like a real um, kind of controlling quality, a, a judgmental quality, a, a, like a, you know, are you really going to eat that? Are you kidding me? Did you really? No, you shouldn't be eating that. You know, like or or like just sort of badgering ourselves about these things all the time. And it's like. You know, if you if you were spending the weekend with a friend and you followed her around saying, you know, like don't even look at that, or you know, or or, or you know, uh, or she was eating and you were like, 
you know, I can't believe you're eating that, blah, blah, blah. You know, like it, it probably wouldn't go so well as sort of a, um, you know, that kind of like level of, of sort of, you know, control and, and, you know, badgering that happens versus kind of like a, a, um, like a, a kind sort of like, oh, you know, you know, what would be really great for dinner is some, you know, this and this, you know, like, or, oh, like, let's, let's, let's make a, a really wonderful dinner, uh, which a wonderful dinner is usually something that actually is quite nutritious. Um, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a treat dinner is often something that is not too, too nutritious. And I, and I think actually within that too, I want to want to just mention about another way to look at food is, is, you know, because we can get into these categories of good and bad. And sometimes that, that just feeds that parent child sort of dynamic of like this, I'm being a good girl or I'm being a bad girl or, you know, all those things. But actually the other way to think about it is some food, we have food that are, so so in being a human and about overall health, the big goal is to, is to balance input and output um, and to really say, you know, both in terms of energy level and general like well-being and everything else. And some foods are really, um, and, and input means all the things that make us healthier and feel great and give us more energy and output are all the things that sort of drain our energy or, or are, are, are um, challenging to our bodies in any given way, whether that's mentally, emotionally, physically, um, or, or energy-wise. Um, so, so some foods really are, you know, input foods that they have more nutrients than they do, than they, um, they give us more nutrients and they really kind of nourish our bodies and help us heal and, and, you know, prevent cancer and, and sort of patch everything up, right? And there's other, other foods that are really output foods that, that actually take more work to, 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 to process and for our body to, uh, to actually deal with than they, than they gave us. So, so those foods are like the processed foods and, the, and, and things like that, because they, those processed foods, when they process foods, they actually really take most of the nutrients out of them. They add some back in, but those nutrients that they add back in are, are really pale in comparison to what's in fresh vegetables. Um, and so, uh, so when we're eating those processed foods, we actually are expanding some some nutrients in order to, to break down those foods. But we're not getting those nutrients back. We're just getting the the calories and and the you know the macros. You know, we'll get like some protein, maybe some fat and some, some carbohydrates, but we won't really get all of the the nutrients that are there. So, so we're actually kind of at the end of the day eating those those foods. We actually are, you know, have a little bit more of a nutrient deficit as opposed to um, to improve nutrition. Um, so that kind of idea of there being, you know, foods that that you know, and I really think of it as being like, you know, the short term plan versus the long term plan. You know, that like, you know, what's going to make me have like, a, a, you know, sort of a dopamine boost, which gives me kind of that feel good feeling for like five minutes. Like just think about like ice cream or um, uh, or, you know, some, some kind of a, you know, high fat, high sugar, um, sort of, um, uh, food and then, and, but then kind of like those same foods that give you the short term sort of real big boost are often the things that give you that long term, not feeling quite as well. and really like deplete your body over, over time as well. Um, Can I ask, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I must, I, cause I missed a couple of your sessions, but all I drink is water. Because I can't mm -hmm. drink peas because it upsets mm -hmm. me, and your yeah. juices are full of um, sugars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, what, what do, do I, I do, and how much should I be doing then? Yeah, I water, don't know you can get to a poison, a place of poison. To yeah, your body. right, right. Well, water is great. You know what? What one of the things we were talking about was drinking, you know, uh, a gallon or more of water a day, um, and then that can be excessive. Very, you know really unless you're like really trying to do that it's hard to do that and if you're not if you're not doing any really intensive exercise or doing any profuse sweating it, water is a, a just fine uh, drink it's actually the best drink to have um so that's fine to, to continue with your with your water intake um you know really that like you know uh about you know 10 cups a day at least is a really good kind of starting place to work with um the uh um and then, and then that, that sort of that formula of, you know, half your body weight in ounces is a good sort of general idea for how much water you might be able to want to drink in a day. Um, but in terms of getting into like, you know, sort of dangerous, you know, levels of water that it can cause trouble, that's more when we get up towards that, you know, up towards a gallon kind of uh, thing is for some people, if they're not getting enough of the, the electrolytes that can cause some trouble, especially if it's like a dramatic quick increase there. How much am I? I'm going to be 
stupid. How many ounces are in a gallon? Uh, is it 64? 64. I think it's 64. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah. 128. What? 128. Okay. 128. Yeah. Oh, you. okay. Thanks. Because so that, that, I also know it's like 64, but that doesn't actually, like, hold on. Does that would be how many you would want to drink. Thank you all for, I appreciate right. the math. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. thank you. Yeah. 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 So if you, you know, if you were, you know, a 250 pound person, like, you know, drinking a gallon of water would be, would be really good. Um, if you weigh less than that, kind of all depends on how much, you know, physical activity you're doing and making sure you're, you're hitting your electrolyte, uh, goals as well um so so how do you know if you're you're hitting your electrolyte goals <laughs> uh, mostly you know the people you know a lot of times it shows up on labs or people will feel like lightheaded or they'll feel like they they when they stand up they feel dizzy um what are some other signs of that you can get a headache mm -hmm. the headache is a big one especially if you're you throw in that kind of hyponatremia that the headache more happens if people like it's like a sudden thing if they if they go from drinking not much water to drinking a lot um they, the headache becomes more predominant but um but definitely something to think about if you're changed your water recently and you're getting headaches that's um good thing to, to reflect on there and whether it, it it changes too fast or you're not getting enough electric mostly though kind of in a big sense though the big way you know you're not getting enough electrolytes is that sort of that sitting to standing feeling like a little bit woozy um that's one way we know that that we need to think about electrolytes a little bit more. Um, kind of the, usually a first sign for people. Okay. And someone had mentioned the um, Gatorade. Isn't the low fat ones, they have artificial sweeteners and stuff in them? They're, they do. Yeah. They have a lot of them have the, uh, the sugar alcohols in them, which again aren't, aren't as bad as like the aspartames and things like that, but also have their own drawbacks. So, so my best, my favorite um, uh, sort of drink you know uh, electrolyte replacement is actually to take um to have a salty snack and they um uh and just put a little bit of fruit juice like about 25 percent fruit juice in the water so you get your potassium from the fruit juice and you get a little bit of salt some people add the salt rate to the water um the but you can also just have a salty snack you know like like a, a peanut butter uh, oat ball um the or like a um even a um you know, any, a lot of the, the protein bars that people have, have have a significant amount of salt in them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, actually, if you get that, you know, that recharge is like the, the organic version of Gatorade. And that's basically what it is, is diluted fruit juice with a little bit of salt added. So you can kind of basically make that on your own. Recharge, you said? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So um, is that good or not good? It's <laughs> good. It's good, but you're but you're better off making it on your own, where you just add okay. one quarter fruit juice and you and you can put a little salt in there, or eat a salty snack. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. Does it matter what kind of juices you're adding to it? Um, nope. I mean, it, it it can be any kind of juice. You know, like the the uh, you know a, a berry juice is probably the best. And we're going to talk about blueberries later today. But like a blueberry juice is wonderful. Um, grape juice is great. But, but really that's actually really specifically for if you're doing intensive exercise. So if you're going out, you know, for uh, a big hike or you're doing anything where you're gonna be sweating a lot is when that becomes really necessary. Otherwise water is just fantastic. It's really the best. Okay, and one last question about what you drink. I don't usually drink coffee, but mm -hmm. my friend told me that there's been a big study about drinking a cup of coffee a day, whether it's caffeine, caffeinated or not for your health. Is that true or false? So I always say coffee, I, I collect all the pro coffee research because I love coffee. It tastes so good. Um, and, and yes, coffee is wonderful. It has a lot of antioxidants in it. It's actually, there, there's some studies about it improving memory and mental function. Um, however, if you're a person who experiences anxiety or doesn't sleep well, coffee is not good for you. Like this is, uh, um, you know, especially if it gets worse when you, when you drink the coffee. So, you know, they're like, I, you know, really it's like one of those individualized things. Basically what happened was the coffee industry uh, put a lot of money into, into creating pro coffee research. Um, and the same thing happened with chocolate uh, prior to that. And it was actually really funny because I, I went to a talk with Michael Pollan and he said, just wait a few years. The, the chocolate industry just put a bunch of money into, um, into doing research and like yeah sure enough a few years later was when we started to see all the things about dark chocolate and heart health and everything else and and the real truth is that it's very hard to study to study these kinds of things like nutrition in general is a extremely hard science because it can never be something that is 
uh, isolated, an isolated variable, right? So, so the same people who drink coffee for breakfast, maybe they're getting up earlier in the morning and they're drink, that's why they drink coffee for breakfast, you know, with breakfast, you know, the, the same people who drink coffee, you know, might be um, having bowel movement after they drink their coffee. And maybe that's what actually creates this health benefit. So, so nutrition research, always look at it with a really serious uh, um, kind of uh, skepticism. skepticism. Yep. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because you can't, you know, that you, you'll find people who say one thing about nutrition and then you can find people who say the opposite and both have their sort of studies to back them up, but they're all these observational studies and observational studies are sort of known in science as being the least valid of, of the ways to study things. Um, so, but the things that never change about nutrition are vegetables and exercise. <laughs> that, those things, nobody's ever come up with a research study that says the vegetables are actually bad for you. Uh, so, so you're, as long as you're eating your vegetables and, and moving your body, you're, you're, that's, you're moving in the right direction. Um, does, that, does that, do they have to be organic? make a big difference too? No, that, the, the dirty dozen is the list I like to look at for that. Um, so if you if you kind of are in a place where it's not not accessible to get all of your foods organic, the, um, the dirty dozen gives you a good sense of which are the most important ones to get that are organic. Um, and that changes every year. So oh. um, so I do want to make sure we kind of keep moving because I just realized we're, we're sort of running, running up on time and, and there's a bunch of other things on here. Um, does everybody have the handouts from this this time? Yes. Um, cool. So I think what I'll do is actually let the easy way to prepare fruit and vegetables, I'll let that kind of stand as its own list. Um, there's a lot of other possibilities there, but those are the ones that I find people getting the most sort of uh, um, actual real life you know, benefit from. Uh, so in terms of ways to get just like a few extra vegetables worked into your, to your diet and especially, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, the the really the biggest if I was if there's anything on this list that's the biggest trick it's to to chop things up when you get home from the grocery store and they're so much more likely for you to eat them or for anyone in the house to eat them. Um, it's kind of like magic, you know. Once you chop it up, it gets it gets eaten really quickly. Um, so so I do want to. We have three more kind of grocery store superfoods that I just want to talk through, um, just because these are. And again, I could have chosen literally anything, but these are these are ones that I think of as really something I, I end up. I kind of chose the ones that I tend to prescribe the most often, uh, because um, as you know, as treatments for certain conditions, partially because there is some good research about these the compounds that are in them, you know, really helping in certain medical conditions. Um, so mushrooms are really, um, uh, really excellent for supporting your, your immune system. So they help you make more white blood cells. Um, they also white button mushrooms, those good old, you know, the cheap, regular old mushrooms, they actually have, uh, um, some good effects of preventing cancer, um, especially breast cancer. So they have this anti-aromatase activity, which means that they, um, stop the conversion of estrogens. And, uh, and that means that they, they help the stop the breast cancer, any breast cancer cells from growing. Um, they, it also is really good for prostate and colon cancer. So anyone who has a, a history or a family history or a personal history of prostate or colon cancer, um, I say, you know, getting an average of a quarter cup of mushrooms a day, and this could be cooked or raw, um, is, is really excellent for sort of, uh, for prevention. Um, and, uh, and just as like a little that, you know, party fact, uh, they are, they do contain vitamin D actually, not, not in huge quantities, but they do contain vitamin D. Um, and then also they contain some selenium, which is really good for your thyroid function. Um, our soils are actually pretty, uh, pretty low in selenium. So, uh, so, so we do need to think about how to get selenium sometimes, um, if you're not getting it from, from a multivitamin, um, the, the two best sources are going to be, um, your mushrooms and, uh, Brazil nuts is another great source of selenium. Um, and then shiitake mushrooms are the ones that I really use when people, um, either have just recently been sick or are recovering from surgery or, um, have a low white blood cell count. Um, cause they actually, the polysaccharides stimulate the production of white blood cells, um, that help to do all of that repair and recovery from infections. Um, if they also reduce cholesterol and, um, one of the things to think about is that using mushrooms as a, as a meat alternative also is a great way to support yourself and reduce your cholesterol because, you know, if you do, you know, half turkey, half beef and, and half fed up mushrooms, it really feels, you feel like, you know, the, the texture is very similar to meat, but you're actually getting, 
um, both the, the direct cholesterol reducing activity of mushrooms, but you're also getting the, the lack of, you know, the, some, a food that doesn't have the, the saturated fats that the meat has. So you're just sort of, it, they call it a meat extender is a great way to think of it. So it kind of makes you feel like there's more meat in the dish, but there isn't. Um, and then the beta glucans in there um, are great anti-inflammatory. So I, when I think about this, that's part of the mechanism by which it's supportive of your preventing colon cancer. Um, but also that those beta glucans are good for reducing inflammation elsewhere as well. Um, so just in general, if we if we wanted to have like a big umbrella for mushrooms, we think about um, mushrooms are good for immune activity, um, and um, and immune activity is really important for cancer prevention. Um, so um, you're saying a quarter of a cup a day is like enough. Yep, totally. Yep. If you're using it more for that kind of um, cancer prevention and, and that, you know, that's a quarter raw. So when you cook it up, of course, it's going to be a lot less than a quarter cup. Um, and, uh, um, and so, yeah, even making it into um, one, uh, um, a good way to get a bunch of mushrooms in is also to make like a tapenade. So making like a mushroom tapenade with a little bit of olives in it. Um, is a great way to get in a bunch of mushrooms as well. Um, and really, you know, kind of throwing them into to any, you know, anything that you're cooking, you chop them up small enough. A lot of people don't like the texture of mushrooms, but if you chop them up small enough, they can, you can, you know, mix them in with a, with the ground meat and, um, or, or other vegetables. And you often can't really detect them very much in terms of the texture. Um, Another food that people often say they don't like uh, is beets. Um, so if you don't like them, just don't bother with them. But uh, where I use them therapeutically is often for the uh, um, blood pressure lowering effects and also for erectile dysfunction. So um, both of those things really um, depend on having some increased nitric oxide and nitric oxide is the compound that makes your blood vessels relax. Uh, and so uh, we do have to be careful with people drinking beet juice if they already have low blood pressure. Um, if, if a person tends towards low blood pressure or feels really dizzy when they stand up, we want to watch out and not have them be drinking a bunch of beet juice. Um, the, um, they also, one of the foods that's really high in lutein, which is really good for your eye health. Um, uh, blueberries are another one that's really good for your macular, the macula, uh, macular health as well. Um, so, uh, um, and then sort of there's a traditional use of, of um, beet as, as being liver supportive. Um, and they do have some compounds that help the uh, phase two pathway um, and, uh, and also reduce inflammation in the liver. So, so they're good liver food. They also really lovely to cook with like a root roast. If you cut up a lot of root vegetables and throw them in the oven, it's one of my favorite easy kind of recipes. Um, and make it look pretty. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also the other thing, a good trick for beets, because it, it can be really annoying to cook and to prepare, is uh, in the grocery store, you can get the little, in, with like the, near the salad dressing, they now have these, the pre-cooked beets, and that makes it just super easy to throw them into all kinds of things. So, um, so I like those, and they even have organic <laughs> options sometimes. Um, they have to be red. Nope, they don't have to be red. You can do the yellow ones, it's just fine. Yep, yep. The, the red does have a little bit more of these anthocyanidins. Um, anything that's like red or purple has a little bit more anthocyanidins. However, it's it's not not really, you know, in terms of red versus yellow, you're still getting all the, most of the same benefits from the yellow or orange ones. And they're just a little easier because they don't stain everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is this like a quarter of a cup too? It's like everything pretty much if you get a quarter of a cup of some of these vegetables in your meals during the day, you're, you're staying on top of things. Pretty much. You know, I think that if you wanted kind of like a general how to how to how to get these things in, if if every day at least half of your plate is vegetables and you change up those vegetables all the time, then you're doing great. Uh, so, you know, that's a good kind of like general general overview of like what, what we're shooting for there. Um, so you don't have to be, you know, really calculating out how many beets, how many mushrooms, how many everything have I had, unless, unless we're treating for, if you've had prostate, if a person has had prostate cancer or colon cancer, that's where we do kind of think about make, kind of trying to get, get that quarter cup in a day. Um, uh, but, but in a general kind of overall health sense, that's just a good pers it's a general perspective. Um, so um, blueberries, Blueberries, I, I saved them for last because they're they're just wonderful in all of the ways. Um, the uh, so they're really nutritious. They actually have one of the highest ORAC values. So ORAC value tells us how much of an antioxidant affects 
that has was the oxygen radical absorption absorption capacity. But it's um, I actually had to look that up because because I always use the word ORAC and somebody asked me what does that mean and I said oh dear <laughs> I don't know because you know just everybody you know in all the conferences and everything everybody just says ORAC and yeah so now now we all know that that means oxygen radical absorption capacity. Um, uh, so, so really the, um, the, the wild blueberries are actually a little bit higher in that ORAC value because it's really the skins that give you the most, um, the most of that effect. Um, and so you can get those frozen wild blueberries uh, and they're great to add into any kind of a smoothie. They're also really wonderful just as like a treat at night. I take them and put them in the microwave um, and they're warm blueberries and it kind of feels like eating blueberry pie. You don't even have to add sugar. It actually is a really lovely treat. Um, the, uh, um, they're, they're really high. So flavonoids are a really great antioxidant. They're also really good for helping to reduce um, allergies as well and inflammation. So um, really, they're ec really excellent high in, in flavonoids and anthocyanins, um, which are both, again, also have an anti-cancer property as well. Um, and then uh, two ounces a day has been shown to reduce blood pressure by four to six percent, which is significant. A lot of medications are really in that four to six percent range. Um, and so, uh, so they're really great for that, especially I talk, you know, think about them and talk about them a lot in folks who have diabetes because they, they do both that heart health protection, but they also um, help to reduce the blood sugar as well. Um, so again, that kind of two ounces a day is, is a therapeutic dose for reducing blood sugar as well. Um, and the way that they do that is by improving that insulin sensitivity. So it's a really similar mechanism of action of some of the main medications like metformin specifically. Um, so, uh, so it's nice because they're doing all the things. But also people who have diabetes need a little bit more of that um, antioxidant protect protection because the, the sugar itself will actually um, cause the, uh, that irritation of the blood vessels that has kind of an oxidant type effect. Um, so, so you need more antioxidants in order to, um, to, when you have diabetes, you just have a bigger need for antioxidants. Um, so blueberries are all around good in that, in that circumstance. Um, they're so a very small study, so we can't really hang our hat on this, but it's just like, oh, another thing that blueberries do is that it, um, showed that there was a, uh, improvement in cognitive performance after 12 weeks of eating, um, that two ounces of blueberries a day. So, um, so that's another reason to add to the list to make blueberries a, a regular part of your, of your food intake. Um, the, uh, um, really great to have, you know, um, for blueberries, you know, uh, they make a great snack as a, as a little treat, but also that cooking them a little bit. Um, and, uh, and they really, they go well in a lot of smoothies as well. Um, so, uh, the, the warning there is, is one time I, my husband was going to the dentist and I made him a smoothie with wild blueberries right before he went. And then he came out and he smiled at me and he had all these little black flecks on his teeth. And I was like, oh no. And he said, he said oh yeah, they, they did sort of act like my teeth. <laughs> so, so note to self, do not eat, drink a wild blueberry smoothie before going to the dentist. <laughs> it makes your teeth look like they're really having some trouble. Um, so, um, or going to do any kind of a public anything. Uh, so uh, that's a so good yeah. step. That's a good story. Um, can, <laughs> I, can I ask a question about the wild blueberries? Because um, of late, I usually buy the Cascadian uh, frozen organic ones. Mm -hmm, and I'm mm -hmm. having a, a hard time finding them. And mm -hmm. I see the Wyman's frozen blueberries. And Tony and I were talking and he said, you know, can we just get the wild blueberries? And I said, I don't know if they're, you know, pesticides and stuff. And then he, he brought it up. He said, well, if they're wild, are they getting sprayed? And I'm like, so are wild regular blueberries okay to eat? Are, are they? Yeah, they are actually. So they, they do, they're not, you know, they're not, the Wyman's are technically organic, but they do the wild blueberries, like, like a lot of wild uh, um, varieties actually require less, a lot less, um, pesticides because they have a little bit more protection that extra your know, skin to inside ratio makes them have less pests and then so they don't need as much of the the pest control but they also are more resistant to all the, the fungus and the, all the other things that affect regular blueberries so um okay. so yeah the wild blueberries the the last time i looked that up so that was it was probably a few years ago was that was that the wild blueberries actually a very minimal if any kind of anything applied to them um okay so, they're a really okay. good option. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody?
anybody else have any questions or either related to this or not related to this? I do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go for it. When you're thinking about carbs, mm -hmm. is it better to get the carbs from fruit and vegetables or is it just the same from like um, grains or rice or potatoes? That is a great question. Yep. A carb is not a carb is not a carb. You know, it's like really it's where you're getting them from. So whole grains is, you know, is an excellent source of carbohydrates, you know, partially because anytime you have the full grain, especially if you're boiling the grains. So, so there's like whole grains that are made into flours that make breads and pastas. And, and that's better than not whole grains, but it still, it still doesn't have that benefit of being, it's still in the little grain package. You know, the, the grain package makes it so that you're getting a lot more, um, your body's have to, having to work harder to get to the carbohydrate in the middle. And that means it's gonna be a lower glycemic index. So it's gonna go into your bloodstream more slowly. Also the whole grain itself has a lot of nutrients um, where when they when they process a grain to make either either pasta or white bread or anything like that, they're removing so much of the nutritive uh, you know, part of the grain. So they're just basically leaving the starch and that doesn't do us a whole lot of good. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so kind of if we were going to make like a, you know, glycemic index and slash, you know, nutritional scale, you know, over here, you'd have, you know, uh, the, the, the white grains, well, your white bread, white pasta, which is really not so great for you in, you know, nutritionally. Um, and then you'd have the, the whole grain breads and pastas are a little step up and then like way a whole big, big step up is going to be those boiled whole grains um, that, that have a lot more nutritive quality to them. Some of the ones that people kind of forget about as being really wonderful grains um, that are even more nutritious than, than kind of our traditional brown rice. And the things that is actually buckwheat is a really good one. And, and despite its name, it contains the word wheat. It is a gluten-free grain um, that's very nutritious and very wonderful. It makes actually really wonderful salads too. If you make like, you know, veggies and buckwheat and, and you know, some spices and everything, you can make a really delicious salad makes a great breakfast, um, uh, like almost like an oatmeal, but a little bit more nutritious than oatmeal, um, and a little bit lower glycemic too index. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a good, it's just a great grain that kind of gets forgotten a lot of the time. Um, amaranth is another one that, that sometimes can, can serve people don't really think about it much, but it's delicious. And it, it's like, if you want to use a, instead of couscous, these little tiny balls that, that work like couscous. So if you want to make a couscous salad, or you don't want to use a couscous because that's a refined uh, wheat grain. Um, the other thing, um, quinoa is another one that's, that's very nutritious and has a lot of protein and is a great, grain to use. Um, so in terms of, you know, fruit and vegetable carbohydrates versus, versus, you know, grain carbohydrates, um, a lot of people do better with the fruit and vegetable carbohydrates for a couple of reasons. One, because they're, um, they're slightly less of this, they have less of these kinds of starches that can be kind of inflammatory, specifically when I'm thinking about that and being about the wheat one, that hemolopectin A can be a little bit inflammatory, where the starches that are in, say, squashes or sweet potatoes or those kinds of things don't, don't have those same types of starches that we find in the grains. The grains themselves are actually, you know, we, here they've been bred to be bigger and bigger grains, so they have more of that kind of starch in them that, that isn't, you know, there, there's, yeah, there's different components of that. They aren't so, don't serve us quite as well. The other thing about vegetables is that you get a much higher ratio of fiber to carbohydrate. And anytime you have a higher fiber to carbohydrate ratio, it's going to be a lower glycemic index, which means it's going to come into your body more slowly. Um, and, uh, and that's always good because that, that little pancreas trying to count the, the sugars really appreciates it when things come in slowly. So it can really appropriately make, match the, the, the amount of insulin to the carbohydrate. Um, and anytime also when you can have, you know, more nutrients coming in with the carbohydrate, these, the, the idea of empty calories um, is that, you know, we have these a lot, lots of refined carbohydrates that, that don't fill us up. You know, if you eat a bunch of white bread or even pasta, you can feel like you don't really, you can eat a lot of it without feeling satiated. Um, where when you eat something like squash, uh, a lot of times you get a much more of a satisfied feeling of, of like, you know, spaghetti squash versus a pasta. You get more of, uh, at the end of the meal, kind of a feeling of like, oh, I've had plenty, thank you. You know, like that's enough. But, um, and that's partially because of the nutrient density of it. So your body is reading, uh, you know, your body gives you that signal of satiety more when you're eating more nutrient dense foods. Um, also when, when there's more fiber as well, um, you get more of that, that kind of a, a signal. Um, so the amount of carbohydrates that a person can eat in, in pasta is much higher, partially because of those signals not really coming in. 
um, because there's not enough fiber or nutrients to signal um, signal satiety. Is that the same for whole wheat and all these new cauliflower and chickpea? And I mean, it's just like. <laughs> yep, the cauliflower and chickpea are actually a lot better because they have a lot less of the carbohydrate in them and more of the fiber. So their fiber to carbohydrate ratio is, is much higher. Um, the, um, in terms of whole wheat, I, you know, really, if you, the closer it is to the grain, the better on the sprouted whole wheat is even, even a huge step higher in terms of, in terms of being low glycemic. Um, but the, uh, um, but whole wheat itself, um, made into a flour, you know, still, still not the most ideal. Um, so it'd be much better off eating a sprouted grain bread or, or, or pasta, but, or a, um, or a whole uh, boiled grain um, type of a whole grain, yeah. And one last thing, super cake food. What's super cake food? You have that on your notes here. Super cake food. Oh, oh, that's what um, that's what the thing that is the um, uh, you. I wrote about how you can do the muffin tin quiches. Um, it's a superfood cake. It's a um, you can get these veggies made great. Is the uh, is the the um, the brand name and they're frozen so that, so some people love to make them in their muffin tins and other people like to buy them and you can get the, the ones that are really the most nutrient dense are the the frittata it's an egg white frittata and there's also a superfood cake and they're great i mean you can you get a little box of six and they you know you heat them up for like you know 30 seconds they're not organic unfortunately but but as like a, a nutritious breakfast um that's a quick option they're really good um so even better if you can make your own you know but but you know, I always have some in the freezer for when I don't get around to making them because where are you finding them? Because I've been looking. Oh, Big Y. Um, I found them at, at Big Y and Stop and Shop. And actually, I found them at Target the other day, too. They're in the frozen section. Are they with health food or no? They're with breakfast food, actually. With breakfast. Thank you. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. I'm sorry to ask so many questions. Oh, no. Absolutely. All right. So we're running up on time. If anybody has any last uh, burning question, I'm happy to answer. All right. So, uh, so coming up to be, you know, coming attractions, <laughs> um, we have a reflux uh, is the next um, one to, to come up and um, that'll be on Thursday at noon. So, uh, so if you'd like to come to that, and then the next workshop is going to be a, a deeper dive into blood sugar um, than we did. We kind of did a surface level dive into blood sugar. We will review some of the things we talked about last week, but then we'll go into it a little bit deeper. I actually recommend that class, not just for people who have prediabetes or, or diabetes, but I also recommend it for people who have experiences of low blood sugar, because sometimes, um, really, really getting into what are all of the mechanisms that control blood sugar uh, can be helpful for, for addressing that. And, and of all the things that help people feel better throughout the day, I think blood sugar regulation is, is uh, very much on the top of that list there. Um, so even above any herbs or anything that I use, that, that one gives people the best kind of responses. Yeah. One other question, I'm sorry. Um, this new burger, Beyond Burger stuff, is that really healthy i look at these things and it's like all it's veg all not pickles no okay it is yep your 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 instinct is correct on that one yeah yeah <laughs> yep. it's it, the saturated fats in there it was, yeah it's not not okay. not necessarily better yep i've got to go oh, you got to love bill gates you got to love everybody. bill gates thank you <laughs> right. bye take care good night everybody